Hey there, I wanted to uh, briefly go through how to evaluate these report PDFs that come out of the um, Ordinary Least Squares tool in ARC. Uh, this is for Lab 10, where we're dealing with the Bigfoot data relative to census data. Um, this is the, the PDF that comes out. They're not necessarily in the order that, um, that um, Esri works you through in their dissecting the statistical report section but I just wanted to touch on a couple of these briefly. Like I said, I'm not a statistics expert, but if I can do this, you can do this. Um, for those of you who do have a strong statistics background, the rest of us would greatly benefit from your experience and your expertise. So please feel free to share what you know, um, correct the things I'm saying, stuff like that on the forum or the discussion board. Okay, so the first thing is to assess the model performance. I can find that information. They're talking about the R squared values. Um, it's on the second page here in the OOLS Diagnostics. Um, what this is telling us is that around 15 or 16 percent, 16 or 17 percent of um, the story is being explained by the variables that we chose. So again, my, my um, example is going to be different from yours. I was dealing with a couple different uh, variables in California and basically my results are telling me that around 16 percent, 17 percent of my story of um, the relationship is basically being explained by the three variables that I chose. Okay, so on the first page is where we see our probability and our coefficients. So remember our intercept, so basically here's the females, um, it says PhD, that's wrong, it's, this is um, females, uh, the percentage of females in each, each block group that has um, at least high school education. This is our population density variable, and this one is the median age. And if we look at the probability, the asterisk um, tells us that these are all statistically significant variables. They're small numbers, and the asterisk is what um, gives us the go-ahead that these are statistically significant. Um, our coefficient is what explains the kind of relationship. So this um, is a little bit harder to visualize, I think, with the probability of use. The example that um, Esri gives us in their write-up is um, if you had it per capita, this would say that if you, have, if you add one person to your variable, your um, dependent variable, that you'd expect to see a, I don't know, what the unit would be on this, but some incremental inc or decrease in this case as you add each person. So it's a little bit harder, I think, to understand with the probability of, um, of use as our dependent variable. But basically what's, what they're saying here is as our probability of use or our density surface value increases for Bigfoot sightings, we're having a negative relationship. So the um, actual median age is going down slightly. Same with the population density. Very small number, but as our um, density of sightings increases, we're actually seeing a very slight decrease in population density, which is pretty much opposite of what I would have thought. Um, with the females with at least a high school education, it's the opposite. As sightings go up, um, the proportion of females with high school educations is also going up in a much stronger way. So that's basically what this page is about with our model variables, our coefficient and probability, that's what those tell us. Okay, so the next section of the report is where we start picking apart the variables and looking at their own specific distributions. Um, these scatter plots ideally would show a little bit more, uh, I don't know, direction. They look like just scatter shot. Um, this one is yeah, obviously a little bit, um, I don't know, non-ideal. But I think what they're suggesting is that you want to look for um, this statistic here, this Jacques Barra statistic. This number should be greater than ideally 0.05 um, and definitely bigger than um, 0.01. It's saying that when it's less than, when this p-value is less than that, that's when um, we're dealing with um, variables and residuals that aren't normally distributed. So. Yeah, they're basically, they don't need to be bell-shaped, and they're data, they don't need to be a normal distribution, but I think some, um, some greater sort of organization, these values would be ideal. 
Um, this is just more, I think, to look at where does it come back? Uh, I think I had something else to say about that. Anyway, um, yeah, this, hang on, I'm gonna pause, I, I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> okay, I remember. Uh, what I was going to say is that while you're in here, what you'd be looking for are outliers, and in your own work, you'd go through and pull out these variables one by one, and then test the results again, and just see if you can get a better fit on your model. Um, for this class, obviously, we're not going to go through that exercise. Um, you've run it once, you understand how to set up the process. Um, what you'd go through is, is, is look for the patterns that Esri is describing or your statistical knowledge, um, apply that, and then make adjustments as you see fit. Um, like it says here, the histogram of the residuals should ideally um, match a normal curve, a normal distribution. Um, again, if it doesn't, you'd go back and tweak your inputs, um, pulling out outliers, etc., or pulling out variables entirely um, to see if you can get a better fit. This one I think is really interesting, and I, I didn't know anything about this when I started this lab. I think it's um, it's a cool idea, and the example that Esri shows is really interesting as well. Whoopsie. Basically, saying that if there is some kind of pattern in here, the pattern can tell you uh, what's going on. So in this case these um, lower levels, where does it say this? Um, so here we've got a, a clump on the left and a wide kind of wide distribution on the right and it's saying that the model is doing well to predict values um, with low crime rates and not doing as well in high crime rate areas. So it's going to be specific to your analysis and your inputs. I think mine is pretty well distributed um, there might be something to this kind of pattern that's going on. It's not as evenly distributed as this one. So I would take the time to figure out where this kind of patterning has come from and then tweak my model accordingly. Um, yeah, and that's just kind of an extra page. Anyway, I think this report is incredibly helpful. It does make me wish that I knew more about statistics. Um, the driving take-home message is you cannot just run these tools. You can't just go in and run OLS and take your results and report them. It just doesn't work like that. And hopefully, as scientists, you all know that, that life doesn't work like that. But GIS in particular can never, ever, ever work like that. Um, the tools are so easy. The user interfaces are so easy. You can plug stuff in and never give your outputs a second thought. But you have to be able to defend everything that's coming out of all the tools that you run, um, owning the inputs, owning the outputs, and constantly evaluating what you're doing in order to be doing really valid GIS work in any way. So, um, yeah, I apologize for the slightly uh, inarticulate nature of this recording. <laughs> now, it does reflect my um, sort of inherent discomfort with statistics, but um, I think, yeah, like I said, the take home is go in here and force yourself to figure out what these values are telling you and uh, make sure that you're running models that do have some um, defendable significance. All right, if you have questions, throw it out to the discussion board. Uh, throw it on the forum, and let's see if we can all kind of improve our statistical knowledge in this lab. Thanks.